This is Mount Gilead Savings and Loan in Mount Gilead, North Carolina. I probably started an account with them in 1939. We made loans to a lot of people who couldn't qualify for loans available through other sources. And it was a big help to a lot of people for a long time. You knew you weren't just a number. You weren't just a credit score. He didn't just look at your assets when you're trying to get a loan, but he, he knew about it and he took into account your character and, and what he knew about you. It was closed recently because of, I understand a lot of regulations that they had to go through that uh, they really, a small unit like this, could not handle. Well, we could still be in business, but um, to comply with the requirements of the regulators, we would have to spend so much money that we would lose money. We would become an unsound bank, and our depositors' money would not be safe. Why we hate bankers? I suppose because bankers encourage people to buy things that they can't afford. They're protected by the government, so they, they are legally allowed to uh, rape everybody financially. Oh, the game is rigged. Yeah, we think bankers got the game rigged. Well, when I first started banking, we had a pretty good reputation 40 years ago. Today, we're a little bit lower than a, a used car salesman. We portray and stereotype these accountants and these financial specialists almost as evil. The bankers, the uh, Wall Street, that, those would be my villains. Out of everyone else got bailed out, only one guy actually went to jail for all the things that were happening. And why was that? People like Bernie Madoff <laughs> and people who have committed fraud and taken other people's money. These, these private bankers, they have it too good. These are evil people crushing humanity. I really appreciate the Shylock. <sighs> Friday noon. Yeah, Friday. I want to be sure you understand. Because at one minute afternoon at 12.01, we go into double overtime. Do you hear me? Yeah, sure, no problem. And then on Saturday at 12.01, we redouble. We get through the weekend without resolving this. You, uh, you up on your Shakespeare, Dennis? Well, I, uh, huh? I'll be looking for my pound of flesh. No problem. I will have it for you Friday. Friday? Friday noon. Good. Good. You see what just happened? I just did that guy an enormous favor. I gave him an extension on a debt he's already two weeks late on. And you think he's grateful? No. I guarantee you he's already out there whining about how the greedy Shylock stuck it to him. Does it bother me? No. It's like water off a duck's back. Comes with the territory. Okay, I suppose deep down on some level, everybody wants to be liked. But for guys like me, that's just not in the cards. Like granddaddy always told me, you ply your trade in the financial sector, you better have a thick skin. Yeah. No. No, here. No, you're broke, aren't you? I love this movie. You know what I love about it? That the hero is a banker. Of course, he's the hero because he sucks at being a banker, but still. Take any movie with a banker in it. See if you can spot the bad guy. Now that's a villain. Check him out. Heartless, miserly, feasting gleefully on the misery of others. Kicks widows out of their homes repossesses their big screen TVs. Now that's a guy you can hate. It's a universal truth. We financial figures, and that includes bankers, financiers, Wall Street types, payday lenders, loan sharks, you name it. We constitute the one group of scoundrels that everybody agrees are scoundrels. Yep. Banker hating is an occupation almost as old as money itself. Since day one, we're the people that everybody loves to hate. But do you want to know how all this banker hating got started? And how it got so out of hand? I can tell you what happened. That is, if you really want to know. The 
Historians are not sure who first came up with this whole money lending concept, but it's safe to say that whoever did was somebody that didn't have any. Money, that is. It's actually a wonderful concept because it allows people with money and people without it to benefit from the same money. But this barely gets off the ground when already there's this big controversy over whether the lender is morally justified in charging for this service. Aristotle had a thing about capitalists. He thought that making money off of money was profoundly immoral, and the church inherited that intellectual and moral tradition. Even God has a problem with it. Thou shalt not lend upon usury to thy brother. He that hath given forth upon usury and hath taken increase, shall he then live? He shall not live. He shall surely die. God isn't necessarily against the idea of lending and borrowing. The key phrase is hath taken increase i.e. coming away with more than you started with. It was forbidden in the Jewish scriptures to lend to other Jews. Uh, they defined usury not as charging too much on a loan. They defined usury as charging anything for a non-producing loan. It's a very old idea that you shouldn't take advantage of someone else's need. And so when you lend them money, uh, that's an opportunity to do something kind for them, and you shouldn't expect to be paid for it. Now, the Christians, who also read the Bible, interpret this differently. They take the word brother as meaning any human being. So you have the Jews, who can only charge interest to non-Jews, and the Christians, who can't collect it from anybody. Greed is a sin against God, just as all mortal sins. Inasmuch as man condemns things eternal for the sake of temporal things. You're not supposed to lend money, you're supposed to give it to people. Um, the dilemma with that, there's a limit on how much money people are willing to give away voluntarily. Unlike the monotheistic Jews and the Christians, the Romans recognized dozens of gods. Whether these have a consensus opinion on the subject of usury is unclear. We do know that bankers, known as money changers, do a brisk business in downtown Rome. The Roman world charges an enormous amount of interest to some provincials. So, for instance, charging the people of Cyprus in the first century BC um, almost 50% interest. So they were quite happy to lend huge sums of money. Romans regarded moneylenders as a necessary evil. They were people who lent and borrowed money for a living, and many of the Romans had a love-hate relationship with them in the sense that they felt that they were not the best kind of people. This attitude is shared by Jesus Christ who in an uncharacteristic fit of bad temper is later moved to drive the money changers from the temple. Jesus was angry at the uh, money changers because they had a rigged exchange rate. In other words, they were buying at one rate, selling at another, and they had a big spread, and this is how they made their money. When Jesus went after this, he was not only attacking the priests in the temple, but indirectly he was attacking the Roman Empire. In many respects, he was really crucified, not because he claimed to be the son of God, but because he had attacked this rigged exchange rate inside the temple. <laughs> the fall of the Roman Empire is definitely bad for business. The money market dries up, mainly because in a feudal society, people don't need money. There isn't anything to buy. The feudal lord, once he owned all of the wealth in society, his main incentive would be to just make sure he hung on to it, to keep society in a fixed position with his serfs underneath them, if you like, and you'll end up with a stagnant society. European society became very demonetized. Coins were no longer used as coins. You find them, you know, made into brooches and pendants and necklaces and so on. They were just being used as jewelry. They'd lost all monetary significance. They were just sort of pretty piece of metal with a picture on it. For most of the Middle Ages, the Roman church dominates Europe and keeps a tight lid on usury, but for reasons that are more financial than religious. Churches and governments often pursued prohibitions against usury because it advantaged them. The Catholic Church was one of the largest borrowers for hundreds of years. And of course, the Catholic Church did not want to pay a market rate on its borrowings. The church used the usury laws to the advantage by basically burning at the stake their competitors. And it made quite a bit of money in the money lending business. Go into a particular town and say, oh no, money lending, that's a mortal sin. Burn all the money lenders you know, or kick them out of town or get them out and then take over the business kind of 
on the sly. For most of the Middle Ages, when it comes to banking services, the Jews are the only game in town. Jewish middlemen move Vatican money from Rome to Christian communities across Europe and collect deposits from rich Christians to fund no interest loans to the poor. This situation, of course, results in windfall profit for the Jews and much envy and bitterness from everyone else. Now think of yourself as a Christian during that period. You're not allowed to do this because it's a mortal sin you go to hell. These guys somehow have an exclusion. They don't go to hell for this. You go them and, and have to take a loan, and then you have to pay them interest. So they're making money off of you, committing what you view is a mortal sin. And of course, you're going to hate them. Some believe this early association with money lending is where anti-Semitism gets its start. So think about this. You have a king that goes out on some adventure, so he needs a big loan. So the money lenders put up the money for the loan. Say the adventure doesn't go that well, he's got to repay the loan. Well, the king knows that no one likes the Jews. So he's going to say, well, you know, the Jews have forced me to borrow this money, and we're going to have to raise taxes to pay them off. So what am I going to do instead? I'm going to tell him I'm not going to repay the loan, and I'm going to kick him out of the country. <laughs> and so this happens time after time after time, country after country after country. In the 13th century, England's King Edward I, heavily in debt from constant warfare, accuses Jewish moneylenders of coin clipping and banishes all Jews from England, but not before expropriating their ill-gotten gains. A lot of this anti-Semitism, a lot of the hatred is associated with our hatred of bankers, is associated with a hatred of usury or called interest. And, and to this day, even if we've separated anti-Semitism from banking, we still hate the banker for the same reason we used to hate the Jew. It will be 350 years before Jews are allowed back in England. Some three centuries later, when William Shakespeare sits down to write The Merchant of Venice about a Jewish moneylender, the playwright has probably never himself set eyes on a Jew. The Merchant of Venice is undeniably a play that features deeply unpleasant views about Jews and prejudices against Jewish practices. For most of us, the word Shylock still means someone who is rapacious, who is money-grabbing, who goes after a uh, bond or a loan with kind of no, no glimmer of, of charity. Today, it's what we would call, you know, loan sharks or the predatory lender. That's, the, that's the, the, the image, perhaps, that Shylock has for us today. Despite constant persecution, the Jews' domination of European banking lasts until the dawn of the Italian Renaissance, when the Medici family comes up with a way to loan money at a profit without risking excommunication from the church. Florentine bankers who really invent banking start finding ways to lend money by exchanging the money for you and taking a commission. This is incredibly profitable and pays for the entire Italian Renaissance. Success in banking and commerce makes the Medici family of Florence one of the richest and most influential dynasties in Europe. The way in the Middle Ages that we started getting around usury was to actually create a whole vocabulary. If I make a profit surrounding this loan doing something else, I'll pay you what's called a discretion, a discrezione. I'm giving you money just out of discretion, as a gift or because we were in a profitable legal business together, whatever that may be. Helping to grease things along is the fact that no fewer than four Medici family members eventually become Pope. Of course, not everyone in the Christian world is willing to buy into this budding Florentine-style crony capitalism. And so there is a great long history of people being angry about finance, which will have strong, strong influences on the rise of the left in Europe into this idea that wealth is bad and that people doing it are bad. So they, they grew up together. Capitalism and these ideas against wealth all come from the same spots in Italy.